Hello and welcome to another episode of My Chat With by AussieTheatre.com. Today's guest began his career appearing as Squelch in the 2011 filmed Australian production of Love Never Dies. Subsequently, he was accepted into the Luciano Pavarotti Foundation in Italy and has since performed all over the world as a lyric tenor. But for the past four years, he has starred as Piangi in the West End's The Phantom of the Opera. However, due to the current pandemic, he has sadly been released. But today he's joining me to talk all about his most recent performance in Europe's first social distancing concert with the Orchestra dos Centros in Portugal. I'm Bella Bevan and this is my chat with Paul de Bonnet. Hello. Hi Paul, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm very good. You're looking very sun-kissed. Thank you. So where are you right now? In the south of Portugal. We came here after the concert. Amazing. So I was really sorry to hear um, about Phantom. Um, how have you been holding up? It was devastating, I suppose, for everybody. You know, um, the initial shock of it, um, it was sad. But somehow we knew it was coming. You know, it's just not safe. Um, and there was no point, um, you know, for... Cameron Macintosh to to keep us there doing nothing under contract, you know, it was just uh, the, the right decision, you know. Um, I was already on my way out, per se. I was already ready to move on to something a bit new. Um, so this has been a welcome change for me. Um, but, you know, we have been released from obligation and that's the best way that we can put this because we have been released from the obligation of having to remain under contract while we have an indefinite waiting time. Um, the show will go on, you know, the show will continue on. The legacy that Phantom is will continue. Um, whether I'm gonna be involved in that or the current cast is, is completely a different question because who knows what's gonna happen in the next couple months. Um, but you know what, I am happy and I'm positive. I'm positive that I've had an opportunity already in a time when you think opportunities aren't, don't exist. Um, so we're very lucky and, uh, yeah, I think I'm very optimistic for the future. Yeah. Amazing. So tell us a little about, uh, a little bit about the social distancing concert in, um, Portugal, um, and how it came about. Well, look, the concert itself was a very surreal experience. Um, we performed the last year's concert in the same place, which was a huge success. Um, this year was very different. However, we, the orchestra itself was separated by giant perspex glasses. Um, so the brass couldn't make any mist go onto the, to the woodwinds and the violins were cornered off by themselves, all split by like a acry big acrylic panels. The masks were being worn by the choir. Um, some people in the orchestra were wearing masks as well. Um, and additionally, everyone in the orchestra was two meters apart. So we had to extend the stage by seven meters. Um, which took out the first section of the theatre. And then everyone in the audience was spaced a metre apart from each other and everyone had to have masks and everyone was registered in every seat. So people, if there was to be an outbreak of the virus at any point, they would know exactly where that person was and who was around so that they could be quarantined. Yeah, amazing. And how many people in the audience and how many people in the production? So we had about 800 people watch the show. Um, so a very full house, let's say. Mm. Um, and the production itself, we had a full um, orchestra as well as a 50-piece choir, um, as well as the conductor and four soloists. So it was quite a big production. And was that all musical theatre, just classic musical theatre songs? Yeah, we did the best of musicals. So some Miss Saigon, uh, Phantom of the Opera, uh, Chess, uh, La Cage Folle, all the classics. Amazing. And so how did the rehearsal process work? Did you feel like you had to cut that down a bit for social distancing reasons? Yeah, so the, the, it didn't get cut down. We were in a huge room, so a huge um, like orchestral room. So people were very well and truly um, socially distanced. You had to enter at a scheduled time. You had to sit down, you had to keep your mask on until you were singing. You sang, you put your mask back on, you sat down. Everyone was wearing masks during that time. So no one in was in a proper performance mode. So even the choir sang the rehearsal with their masks on. Um, but, you know, 
here in Portugal, they are a step ahead, they, I believe, uh, compared to the rest of the world. They are implementing things. They are learning from mistakes. They are changing constantly policy on COVID-19. Um, and even in a restaurant, um, everything seems to be really in place and owners are very strict. You can't enter without a mask. You can sit down with a mask. You know, it's, it's very organized. And I think um, it gives a glimmer of hope to all of us in the UK and in Australia that we will overcome a problem like this. Right. And would you say you felt quite safe then throughout the whole process? Absolutely. You know, we had obviously a production manager and she um, was fantastic. You know, our room was sanitized. Um, every time we'd come off stage, our mask would be ready and on and they were sanitized. Um, mm. Everyone applied masks and PPE if they wanted to wear them. Um, you know, alcohol solutions available for disinfecting. Um, everything cleaned all the time. So, you know, again, it's employing a lot more jobs and stuff like that as well for um, all the additional requirements that we need. But if that's what we need to um, to continue to be able to sing and to be able to, you know, deliver wonderful theatre, then that's what we'll do. We're a resilient bunch, us artists. Yeah, absolutely. And did you feel like any part of the performance was taken away because of the social distancing measures? Was it affected much by that? Look, we, yes, we had to do, we did have to modulate and like kind of make some executive decisions about how we do certain things. For example, all I ask of you, how are you supposed to do a performance of that with two artists right next to each other and not touching? We did decide, however, that Amy Manford would sing via a live broadcast in Australia while we had a live artist on stage. Worked perfectly, you know? And for a concert version and for concert music, this is wonderful technology that we're able to implement to be able to achieve so many different things. Obviously in a musical theatre situation, it would be a much more complex kind of situation. Um, but I think small steps for now are the ones that are going to give us the most hope. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in terms of going back to London then, will you have to go into quarantine or self-isolation? What happens next? Um, no, I won't be going um, back to London straight away. I'll be going to France. Um, I'll be doing two little concerts there in France at, near Avignon. Uh, so I will be able to pass my two-week quarantine period in France because it's not a quarantinable country. Um, my my fiancé is from Avignon, so we'll be staying with his family during that time as well. So those concerts in France, are they connected to the one in Portugal? Or they no, they're completely they're just with piano, um, but there will be a small outdoor event. So um, we're looking at 50 people for each of them. That's fantastic that you're, you're keeping performing throughout the pandemic. We have to. You know, we have to keep going. We have to be creative. We have to produce. Um, you know, one thing that I am really proud of um, and one thing that I learned while I was spending time at CQ University in Australia is how much they were pushing um, individual artists to be their own producer and to create their own outcomes and their own events. Um, and now is a time more than any time that we should be doing that. Small outdoor events, soirees, stuff like that, where people can be safely spaced and enjoy evenings outside. And when you've got weather that's glorious like we do now in Europe, why not? Absolutely. I guess it just forces us to be more creative and think outside the box. So in terms of when you get back to London eventually, what is your plan of getting through the pandemic? Do you have any creative ideas or concepts lined up then? Look, nothing in the UK right now, um, but my focus is really just taking a break. You know, for the last five years, I have done eight shows a week. Um, you know, that was from Germany and then flying directly over to London. And at one stage I was even doing three shows in Germany and, and three shows here in London. Like that was my crossover period. So, you know, it's been quite an intense time and I've needed some um, mental rest as well, you know, taking some time for myself, my relationship. Um, so for now, I'm very happy just staying home. I've got 20 students that I teach. Um, so that really does occupy a lot of time and gives me a lot of pleasure. Um, and I can just be home and be safe for now. Um, and while I'm doing that, obviously my creative juices are completely flowing. Um, and I hope to produce some small events uh, in London to start a straight away. Um, one event that I am starting to produce right now is a boy group called Eroli. And it means heroes. And um, I teach quite a few tenors. 
um, who are doing extremely well. And in this time, we've decided that I'm going to produce uh, an opera, popera boy band um, with these young um, English singers. Fantastic. So that is for me one of the biggest focus that I'll be doing with my time during this time as well. Giving myself a rest, giving my voice a rest, and also producing something that is going to in fact help the next generation of artists as well. Well, it was so great to talk to you today. Um, best of luck with the concerts in France and everything you're doing in the UK and I wish you good health. And thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you very much.